Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you again for joining us today um, in the certificate program in practice-based research methods. Uh, today's session is titled PBR methods, PBRN methods, clustered designs. Um, today's session um, on uh, is brought to you by um, uh, Blackboard. Uh, by uh, I apologize, by Clinical Directors Network and the N Squared, a network of virtual training series funded by the AHRQ. Uh, this gives you live access to the archived sessions and the live sessions in the certificate program. Uh, the certificate program is developed by Dr. Jim Warner in partnership and the, su and the support of eight AHRQ funded PBRN uh, centers of excellence. Uh, as always, if you need any uh, help or any technical difficulties in setting up, please double click on Clinical Directors Network um, and please use the chat for any questions that you may have. At this time, I will pass it to Dr. Jim Werner. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, uh, it's really a privilege again to have uh, really elite talent with us today to present on cluster designs. Um, uh, I just want to have a, a few housekeeping things before we begin. Um, first, I want to recognize the N Squared Network and uh, Dr. Jonathan Tobin and his team, Vladimir and others, for doing such a great job hosting these webinars uh, for the PBRN Certificate Program. Um, they are uh, one of the eight. Uh, ARC P30 uh, centers of excellence uh, that are collaborating on this to, to sponsor this program and I uh, just want to recognize them for uh, generously supporting uh, this program by hosting these webinars every month and doing a great job. So uh, thanks to you guys for doing that. Okay. Um, I'm going to be moderating today, but I'm going to have to leave about halfway through, and Amanda Ross will take over as moderator at that point. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce our speakers today. Uh, first, um, when you know, we began thinking about uh, this webinar and knowing that this is a very important topic in practice-based research, I couldn't think of anyone more well-qualified. Uh, uh, than Miriam Dickinson, who is really, I think, uh, the the international expert on cluster designs and practice-based research. So we're really fortunate to have her with us today. Miriam is a professor in the Department of Family Medicine and the Accord Center for Health Outcomes Research at the University of Colorado in Denver. And she's a senior scientist for the National Research Network of the American Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, she has uh, a Ph.D. in biostatistics and postdoctoral training in health services research, and she has expertise in study design in the application of complex analytic methodologies to the challenges associated uh, with PBRNs and clustered randomized pragmatic trials. She has many years of experience as a lead methodologist and evaluator and a co-investigator on many federally funded grants um, focused on research and practice based in community settings, and she's PI on an NIMH R03 grant to use multi-level modeling to examine contextual effects on depression and processes of care in primary care practices. So um, thank you for being with us today, Miriam. I'd also like to reintroduce again to you Dr. Don Neese, who was um, our, one of our presenters, along with Lindy Knox. Um, on community engagement in PBRNs just a few weeks ago. Don will be co-presenting with uh, Miriam Dickinson today. And Don is Associate Professor of Family Medicine also at the University of Colorado Denver uh, where he's the Green Edelman Chair for Practice-Based Research and Director of Community Engagement for the Colorado Clinical and Translational Science Institute. Um, his work involves improving health from the level of individual doctor-patient interactions all the way to community and population-based uh, interventions. His research is uh, conducted largely within communities and primary care practices, notably 
um, on the topical areas of chronic illness and system change. And as we discussed um, previously, Don is PI of the Corey funded project, which he uh, conducts appreciative inquiry, which is a really fascinating process, and boot camp translation, which is also um, a really interesting process of doing uh, quality improvement and um, translating research into practice with rural and urban underserved Colorado communities where they focus on um, and identify priority health topics, factors that facilitate successful out health outcomes, and translate evidence-based recommendations into local solutions. So um, both of our speakers are, are um, exquisitely qualified to be with us and speak on this topic today. So Miriam and Don, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon to you, those of you um, in the Eastern time zone. Um, I want to say that I really appreciate my co-presenter, Don Neese, and that um, probably what we should do is to go ahead and go through all the material and then save discussion and questions for the end because he's actually going to have to leave just a little bit early. So without further ado, let's launch. Okay. Um, the basic content of this webinar um, will be uh, reviewing some of the background of common research approaches, study designs, uh, focusing on clustering, which is uh, common, almost always present in PBRN research. We'll look at some different uh, forms of cluster designs and largely focus on cluster randomized trials. We'll talk about uh, issues around sample size and power, randomization, data analysis, heterogeneity of treatment effects. And then finally, step wedge designs are a kind of cluster randomized trial, and they have become fairly popular recently. And so I'd like to touch on that as well. <coughs> Moving forward. So some of the things that we have to think about when we're um, helping people with research designs are, first of all, the time frame. Is the time frame of the study going to be retrospective, uh, in which case we look backwards at uh, a subject's history? Is it cross-sectional, which is just a snapshot? A lot of uh, survey work is cross-sectional. Or is it prospective, start with the present and follow into the future? All of these designs can involve clustering. Um, person time studies are generally time to event kinds of studies where follow a cohort either at the beginning or sometime during the process as in a retrospective uh, cohort and follow them until they have an event or until they're censored. Often um, um, it's time to death. It could be something like time to hospitalization. It could be time to a procedure, anything like that. But again, all of these designs can um, be carried out in PBRN settings, and they almost always involve clustering. So you're probably familiar from your training with the traditional randomized controlled trial, or RCT. And clinical trials usually, almost always, involve patient-level randomization. Um, they're carried out in various settings, but often are, are designed in such a way that clustering is not an issue, or perhaps there are very few sites and um, they control for side effects in different ways. But what we often end up using in PBRN research is the cluster randomized trial. And the difference there is that the unit of randomization and often the unit of recruitment, at least initial recruitment, is something like a community or a primary care practice. Um, a stepped wedge trial, which we're going to cover as well, is a similar design. And um, it's a variation 
on the cluster randomized trial, and we'll be talking about that as well. There are some related concepts I just wanted to bring up. Some, some of what's in here is for reference for for you to go look up these authors, look up the papers, and think about how it may help you in your own research. And we won't really go into it in detail, but it's just giving you some information. Uh, related concepts that apply to P PBRN research um, are the REAIM framework, uh, Russ Glasgow, who is here in Colorado with us, um, was instrumental in um, promoting this theory, developing and promoting this theory. And I find it's a very good framework for PBRN research. Um, other terms that you see thrown around quite a bit are com comparative effectiveness and pragmatic trials. Depending on how they're done, they can also be st um, stepped wedge or cluster randomized trials. But those are just terms for you to be familiar with. Um, other terms to be familiar with that are related to this area are implementation and dissemination research. And we're often involved in that kind of work where we're trying to figure out how to um, put into place in primary care practices some kind of intervention that has been shown effective, or perhaps two variations of an intervention that have been shown effective. Okay, moving on. So clustering, what, what do we mean by that? Um, clustering or nesting, sometimes it's called nesting, is a common feature of PBRN research and, and as I mentioned before, can apply to any of the common research designs. Um, the, the primary type of PBRN clustering usually involves patients nested within practices. Sometimes we're able to look at it in, at three levels, which is patients within clinicians within practices. Um, it, another kind of clustering uh, involves repeated observations on patients over time or longitudinal studies. And many studies have both kinds of clustering, which ends up making the design and analysis fairly complex. So study design, sampling approaches, power, statistical analysis, all of these are affected by clustering. You can't afford to ignore it when it's present. And it's almost always present in PBRN research. I can't think of a lot of instances where it isn't. There are some, but usually not. <clears throat> so the first example, I'm, I'm just going to use a couple of specific examples here to illustrate some of the issues. The first example is the cluster randomized trial. And as I mentioned before, it's a variant of the traditional randomized controlled trial. Um, the RCT is kind of held up as the, the gold standard of all clinical trials. Usually patients are randomized to uh, randomly assigned to one of two or more groups, and we follow them to see if the intervention improves outcomes. In the cluster randomized trial, in PBRNs, usually the unit of randomization is the practice. Occasionally, it can be a geographic unit. It could be a community um, or a county. We have both examples in our work. Um, but it's a larger unit than the patient. So it, it, one thing to think about when you're designing your studies is why do this? Um, do you really need to do this? Because patient randomized trials are easier and um, generally have fewer issues around analysis and power and various other uh, problems. So you, you really want to think hard about whether you need uh, randomization at a practice level. The usual reasons that we run into that um, make us think we've got to go that direction is that often the interventions target the entire practice or the environment 
rather than the patient per se. A lot of quality improvement interventions are like this. Um, I know, Don, with the boot camp translation, right. these, you, do you, you want to yeah. weigh in on that for a moment? Yeah, um, you know, with boot camp translation work, again, we're oftentimes working at the community <laughs> practice level, and so we're, we're concerned about the um, diffusion of that intervention beyond mm -hmm. the certainly the individual patient, but sometimes even uh, when we're doing stuff in a community, um, how much is this going to diffuse um, across, uh, you know, what we recognize as geographic boundaries, but um, patients don't. Right. Exactly. So contamination is a big issue and often um, a consideration for whether you're going to do patient randomized or cluster randomized trials. Um, a lot of times there are logistical or cost or ethical concerns as well. Um, and these come into play. So one thing I want to mention here, uh, you're probably aware of the consort statement. There is an extension for cluster randomized trials, so be sure to take a look at that as you're designing your studies, and it's very helpful. And you will have to do it when you start writing up your results. Okay, so um, first I'll go through an example of a cluster randomized trial that we did um, here and in Colorado a few years ago. Uh, you, you know, obviously in any kind of, of research study, start with your research question. And the design and analysis should directly address the research question and be congruent with the conceptual model. So uh, keep that in mind as you're designing. Um, an example of a research question is, will a practice facilita facilitation approach based on the chronic care model improve patient care and clinical outcomes for diabetic patients? And the rationale for the choice of study design for a, a cluster randomized trial is that implementing this kind of intervention within a practice will likely affect all the patients and for that matter all the clinicians in the practice. So contamination would be a big problem. You really could not do a traditional RCT. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that the, the hypotheses for a cluster randomized trial are a little bit different than a traditional uh, randomized control trial, and I'll, I'll just illustrate that. So our hypotheses, two of our hypotheses for this study were that improvement in quality of diabetes care will be greater, and here's the difference right here, for patients in practices receiving the intervention than patients in usual care and the improvement in hemoglobin A1C will be better for patients in practices receiving the intervention than patients in usual care. Okay, moving on, sample size. That's one of our very first questions that um, we, we have to address. How many practices, how many patients? And I'm going to make my pitch here early on and make it in a couple of different places, involve a biostatistician early in the planning stage <laughs> throughout the study. Um, so power analyses based on the number of patients have to be adjusted for clustering. Um, the intraclass correlation coefficient, or the ICC, measures the similarity of patients within practices compared to patients in other practices. And I'm sure you've run across that phenomenon in, um, in, in your clinical practice and in your research experience as well, is that practices are different and the kinds of patients that they attract can be vastly different from practice to practice. So it, it affects implementation of the study, it can affect the outcomes, um, there are a lot of things that that can affect, so you have to keep that in mind all the way through. 
So what the ICC measures is the proportion of the total variance in the outcome variable that's accounted for by clustering, and it's often expressed as a percentage. Um, in this particular study for the primary outcome of hemoglobin A1C, we had information from previous work that estimated the ICC at about 5%. Sometimes for process of care outcomes, it can be much higher. So now here's where you want to involve your statistician. Um, but one of the things to take home from this um, is the ideas and the references. And you may or may not want to actually do these analyses yourself. But if you take the ideas to your statistician and work with them as you're designing your study, then um, you'll be on top of it and you'll know what's going to be needed. So just in kind of a simple overview of how you do sample sizes for cluster randomized trials, First of all, you have to get your primary outcome variables, one or more. And then somehow or other, you have to have an estimate of an ICC. We have gotten better about reporting that in the literature. Um, it, it's challenging. Sometimes you just don't know, and you have to guess. It's best if you can put your hands on something from actual data or the literature, but you don't always have it. So the first thing is to calculate what we call the variance inflation factor, or the VIF. And there's a little formula for that based on the number of patients per practice. And then you calculate the effective sample size, which is just the proposed sample size um, divided by the variance inflation factor. And then using that effective sample size or adjusted sample size, you just use that to do a traditional power analysis. This is a fairly ex simple example. I, um, I actually keep an Excel spreadsheet where I have all these formulas set up, and that's how I do it. Different people do them in different ways, but usually, I'll, I'll run several different scenarios in terms of number of practices, number of patients per practice, um, ICCs. These are pretty high for a lot of patient outcomes. They're fairly low, more in the 1 to 2 to 3 percent range for certain kinds of things. We found with diabetes, it's higher. Um, and it, it just depends on what it is. One thing to notice here is this example of 100 patients per practice. Look at the ICC. It's much higher. The, the uh, variance inflation factor, rather. It's much higher. So um, that, can be, that can be an issue. OK. Now, um, now that we know something about how many practices and patients we need, how do we assign them to groups? Um, often we recruit just enough practices to do the study. Uh, sometimes we have the luxury, luxury of sampling practices from a larger pool. And in that case, stratified sampling can help. And I'm not really going to go into that here. Most of the time, we're just struggling to get enough practices to do the study. And we're in the former situation. Um, one of the issues with practice level randomization is that generally the number of practices that have to be randomized is much smaller than in trials where individuals are randomized. We're often talking about, you know, 8 to, eight to 20. And the, it, it brings some issues with it that you don't have to worry about as much with patient randomization. Um, there's heterogeneity among the practices. And again, individuals in practices are more similar than individuals in other practices. Uh, simple randomization can result in study arms that are very
be very different from each other. And I'm going to give an example of that from one of our studies where that happened. Even stratification um, doesn't always take care of that problem. So one of the, the approaches that we have been using, and it's been pretty successful, is a kind of minimization method that was extended to cluster randomized trials. Now again, this is more in the spirit of something to be aware of that you may want to think about as you're designing a study and go talk to your statistician about how to do something like this rather than actually trying to do it yourself. You, you um, probably are going to be wanting to do it that way. So we do something called covariate constrained randomization. And it's particularly useful for PBRNs when you have baseline data available. And usually the baseline data is summary data from the practice. And you want to choose variables that are generally variables that you think are going to be important in implementation of your study or that um, uh, potentially affect the outcome, the patient outcome. So I'll show you an example. Basically, the procedure works like this. You generate all possible randomizations, and you calculate something called a balance criterion. And it, it, it's simply the um, average squared difference between the study groups on these standardized study variables. And you calculate that for each randomization. You can use weights if you want to. We don't usually, but you can. And you establish a criterion for the allowable difference between the groups, and then randomly select one from the set of acceptable randomizations. So moving forward, um, the example here, we had a CKD study. Um, and uh, Chet Fox, many of you know Chet, was the PI on this. It was an NRN study, National Research Network study. And the objective was to test two approaches for improving care for stage three and four CKD patients. So the variables that we selected for randomization, these are aggregated to the practice level. Um, we had a certain amount of structural and demographic data um, that included practice size, uh, race, ethnicity, and um, Medicaid or uninsured, and then clinical data that was obviously relevant to the outcome. And stratification, we had some stratification variables that we had to incorporate into the procedure, and I'm not going to go into that here, but it, it can be done. You can restrict the randomization to only those that meet certain criteria. And the bottom line was that using this approach, we were able to achieve balanced study arms. And what that meant in this case was no significant baseline differences on these aggregated uh, practice level variables. So uh, remember I talked a minute ago about this balance criterion. So the one on the top is what could happen in terms of differences between your group if you just use simple randomization, which is often what's used in RCTs, traditional RCTs. The one on the bottom is the restricted randomization, where at worst case, you're, you're going to have a difference that's relatively small. And so you, you are improving your chances of getting balanced study groups. And this is something that you might want to bring up for discussion when we get to the end. So just keep these in mind. And we'll move on. So next, uh, the next topic I want to touch on is data analysis for cluster randomized trials. When you're designing a study, I, I find, I was taught, and I still do it this way, that you specify your data analysis right at the front end, that you 
you um, specify your hypotheses and you actually write out your models that they're going to be part of the grant and that when you get funded and you collect the data, you go back and you do what you said you were going to do to a large extent. You may do some exploratory things, but you really start right at the beginning and you know what the plan is all the way through. And I do think it's good practice and I still do that. So um, for cluster randomized trials, just like um, just like traditional RCTs, we have to address issues of internal and external validity. And clustering adds a level to be considered. And again, um, go through the, the work of putting together your consort diagram. Who are your practices? How were they recruited? Um, did they drop out? I and mean, we occasionally have practice level dropouts. And um, then you also have to look at that at the patient level or at staff and clinician level if you have staff and clinicians included. Um, you want to think about how representative are the patients and practices to the target population. And that's, uh, again, cluster designs have that element of the practice. So not only are you looking at generalizability in terms of patients, you're looking at generalizability in terms of practices. Uh, did the randomization work? So even in the best case scenario, sometimes you get somewhat unbalanced designs and you have to control for those statistically the best you can when you get to that point. But you do need to look at it and you need to report it. Now, analytic approaches for clustered data, we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be looking at missingness. And uh, then finally, effectiveness. Did the intervention work? OK, so this will be quick. But uh, first step in establishing internal validity is did the randomization work? And basically, are control and interven intervention groups similar on key baseline characteristics? And we just do simple comparisons here, things like uh, t-test, chi-squared. Usually, I just do unadjusted. Um, and an example is our Colorado EPIC study, where we used a stratified randomization approach. It was before we started doing this covariate constrained randomization. And what we found was that, in fact, the, um, the groups differed on baseline process of care. So we'll never know the answer to um, whether there was a ceiling. Hello, Dr. Dickinson. I just asked everyone to stand by as we're having some technical difficulties. It'll be just a moment. Uh, Dr. Dickinson, if you're able to hear me, please uh, type within the chat box. 